Behind every amazing flavor is an amazing human who has perfected their craft. Welcome to Flavors Unknown. A behind the scenes look at new flavors and the chefs, pastry chefs, and bartenders who create them with your host, Emmanuel. Hey there. Welcome to another episode of the Flavors Unknown podcast. I am your host, Emmanuel Laroche. And I have been working in the food and beverage industry for more than 20 years, both in Europe and here in the US. Every other week, I interview trending chefs, pastry chefs and bartenders to share with you their secrets behind the scenes, discover new food and beverage locations around the US and understand the latest flavors and ingredients they are experimenting with. If you are a first time listener, Last episode was the first part of a casual discussion I had in Austin with three local chefs. And this very new episode is the second part of it. Listen, two simple steps you should take if you do not want to miss out any coming, you know, great episodes. First, you can subscribe to Apple Podcasts. And then... Make sure to subscribe to the email list on flavorsunknown.com. Now, let's go back to Austin at the Fairmont Hotel, where the executive chef Andre Natera kindly hosted the recording of this casual discussion between him and the chef Kevin Fink from Emmer and Rye and chef Fiori Tedesco from Locadoro. This is the second part of the recording. Today, so what do you think, which country or slash restaurants around the world that you think that we should pay attention to if there's anything new that are coming? This is not the answer that you're going to want. I think that we are seeking out this celebrity status component that is somewhat unrealistic to this. And I think it gets back to if you're going to Noma, you're not working under Renee. You're not. You know, he has a team of people that are doing that. And you may hear from him. He's incredibly creative, smart, obviously well accomplished, but he doesn't run service every day. And it's romanticized to pretend that he does. And I think that looking at some restaurants that are progressing in this, there are definitely people around this world that are doing things that are unfathomable to any of us around this table. Whether that be because it's a great thing or totally something that should not be done. The ability to question is, to me, what we need to follow. And the ability to seek enough knowledge to have context to this questioning. And I think that what Ferran did Mm -hmm. and what Rene did, the irony of this all is, as creative as it is, it just makes sense. Question the molecular structure or why things happen, Mm -hmm. or what it takes for our world to do it. They just gave us glasses to understand different elements of our world. Ferran and the ability to manipulate things, but based in this very simple reality that is the molecules of food. And Rene in this lens to let nature be nature and express and understand how to get out of the way in a lot of ways. None of those ideas, when you take a step back, are things that don't make sense. They all... So the Mark Zuckerbergs of our world took the most obvious of ideas Mm -hmm. that were in front of us all and just found a way to make it a web that brought us together. And I think Ferran and Rene did the exact same thing. So what I would say is don't look for others and try and mimic what they're doing. Question why you're doing everything Mm -hmm. that you're doing. And make sure that everything in that makes sense because the person that is going to be the next Ferran or Rene is not going to find somebody there. What they're going to do instead is they're going to have a perspective different enough about what we do Mm -hmm. that others will be captivated by it. But do you think, won't you think that the the first steps of creativity maybe starts with copying, you know, people first and then after that, maybe tweaking things with before coming with your own? No, no, I think some of those things come from people that are just unquestioning in uh, having an idea or wanting to be different. Uh, What you're saying, Kevin, really resonates. And if the heart of the question, Manuel, is like finding the new, what is special to find and eat out there in in the world, 
I think about like I'm constantly in seek of soulful experiences. Done some traveling the last year plus, uh, and I've seen some really magical things, some really amazing things. And I am almost always really put off by pretense. I went to, I was in, like, went to a two star Michelin restaurant in the Netherlands a couple months ago that I, I was taken out to that I was lucky enough to have someone ask me to go with them. And there's so much about the experience that I was like, God, why is this what you feel like you have to do to be successful? Is this what you think? I felt like there was a cynicism in the delivery of, of an experience there. It was like, Oh, this, uh, there's a, there's a formula. We got to, we have to do uh, like a certain kind of bread service. We have to have a salt service and a this service and a that service. But what I didn't feel in that whole experience was what was the soul? What was the soul of what was happening there? And generally, when I go to when I'm going somewhere, you know, I want I want to go where I, I see families laughing and where I see a bunch of people gathering in in what seems like like a natural way, people existing in the world. I want to I wanna see how people in whatever this place is, whether this is like Plano, Texas, or Seattle, or Amsterdam, or, or, or Florence, I want a window into what is not authentic, but feels right to them and feels normative. When we go out to like fancy restaurants, I have great admiration for Massimo Batura. And for especially the way he is able to talk about his cuisine and, and his thoughts on the Italian food di diaspora, which is so inspiring to me. But when I went, when I was in Modena last year, I did not go to Austria. It wasn't really important to me. It wasn't important to me if I'm in that place is to go to these tiny little places where I see people gathering, where people are disarmed. Those soulful experiences are the places that most inspire me. And hearkening back to what Kevin was saying about sort of the the breaking down those the the sort of the walls of reason. What are the reasons why people do certain things? With everything always in the world, we we as human beings have all these rules about the way we operate, and so many of them are there for no particular reason except we do. And once you, when you are able to look at them and question them, that is when truly profound things happen. And it might not be profound for humankind. It might be profound just for yourself. And like a ha, 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 I understand why people cook gnocchi this way. Although I, I never really got it before. This one experience sort of turns light on for me. And there is something about, for me, seeking out these soulful, intimate experiences in all the places that I go that really turn the lights on for me and help me answer those questions. I'm going to answer your question just a little bit more literal. If, if the question is what type of cuisine is having its moment right now, and if I was going to open up a restaurant in Austin right now to make a lot of money, what would I open? I would say Mexican cuisine is having its moment. Probably not in Mexico. I don't think they're having a Mexican food moment in Mexico. But here in Austin, I, th I think right now you're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of Mexican restaurants open up, but it's different than the uh, Tex-Mex restaurants that uh, have been in this city uh, previously. With the uh, you know the red and green enchiladas and the queso dip, fajitas was probably the Mexican restaurant of Texas for the last and, and probably throughout the Southwest. But I would say right now uh, you have almost this in between chef driven interpretation of of Mexican food. And I would say probably right now, locally, that's what I see the most of. You know, if you said, Andre, do you, you want to get rich, open up a restaurant, I'd say, yeah, we're serving margaritas and enchiladas all day long. It might not be the most exciting thing for me to serve, but I, I, I think Mexican food or Southwest cuisine in Texas is kind of being, specifically in Austin, and, and I, I think it's kind of being reinvented a little bit. That's more of a literal interpretation of the question. If I was going to say, let's talk about global food trends. When you go to countries of origin, I'm not sure if they're experiencing the same sort of trendy global things that we're experiencing here in the United States in terms of, you know, to use Mexico as an example. I don't know if they're really inspired in Mexico by what they're doing in 
in Spain, for example, or in, in Spain, I don't know how inspired they are and what they're doing in Mexico. I think, I think countries that have very strong roots in tradition, France, for example, are probably just finding better ways to do the food that they've done for years, whether it's finding a more pragmatic approach to, to execute it or whether it's, um, you know, finding and introducing ingredients that may have been a little foreign to them previously, but now are a little bit more ubiquitous in, the, in, in their farmer's markets. So again, just interpreting that question as literal, that's, that's what I would say. So talking about Texas and, and, and Austin here, how is the food scene at the moment in, in Austin? What would you say about it? I love our food scene. It, it's evolving a lot. And I think that, I mean, I, I'm a junkie of this place, right? I, I think that, quite honestly, I'm happy to say this. I think Austin is the best city in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has its faults, has issues. What city doesn't? We have bad traffic. We have a lot of social issues to talk about. We have gaps in our food scene. So what are the three things that you would say for someone to say, like, why, why should I go to uh, Austin to uh, taste new things, you know, when it comes to, to food? We, in many ways, have the Danish complex. And what I mean by that is we don't have a style of cuisine that was ours. Okay. We have Tex-Mex, which is yeah. obviously not... For sure from Austin. Texas barbecue. And it's but. a thing that we don't. And we have Texas barbecue. But where are you getting your beef from Texas barbecue? And what are your sides? And what's your bread? You know, a Texas barbecue is a cult. And it's amazing. And it's a really special thing. But it is also a thing that you cannot have every day. And it is a thing that drives people here, which is great. For sure the most famous, which is Franklin's. Yeah. Everyone, the number one question you ask about Franklin, is it worth it? Well, first of all, Depends on what you're looking at it for. It's the same thing that I would say about Osteria or about Noma. If you're looking at it as a value of meal for dollars, then that's a totally different thing. For me, Franklin's is an experience. It's the line. It's being a part of Austin. It's getting to know your neighbors. It's this process of things that you would never have on your own. And for that, it's worth it. Absolutely. So, you know, the Austin food scene offers a tremendous amount of creativity. It offers some limitless possibilities of things. It offers a camaraderie that we have here. And because it's not so saturated and set in its ways, it also offers a nimbleness to it. And because of that, you've seen a lot of James Beer, a lot of food and wine, a lot of Bon Appetit. Restaurants come out of here because the, the simple thing is we have permissions here to try things that are different. It's not such a saturated market that you can't do something unique because it has to make it. Like New York to me is an issue. And people in, in New York talk about it as the biggest city in the United States and therefore the most diversity in a lot of things. But you cannot miss in Manhattan. So therefore, the creativity is so minimal because you can't do something that is totally unique because if you do and you miss, then you lose everything. And it costs so much just to pay to play that you can't do that anymore. You know, the little small restaurants that you could come up with something totally wacky and creative that cost a lot less money. And therefore, if it went under, was still worth doing, just mm -hmm. doesn't exist there. What are like the unique ingredients and um, flavors that, uh, you know, that are maybe not known without those local, interesting things that you have here that people don't even, you know, think about it, don't even celebrate? Interesting for me, I, I, I grew up in upstate New York. So a lot of the, the, the flora and fauna here is so foreign. Beautiful way of saying it. <laughs> Tell people what that means. <laughs> I think of like herbs and flowers, right? And I think of Hoya Santa. Hoya Santa is uh, the sassafras, right? Sort of indigenous and grows wild here. Has so rich and bright and phenols and tastes almost like extraterrestrial. Like it's so... Rich and pungent, they call it the sassafras, also like the root beer plant. It gives off such bright, strong aroma. You can barely use it, right? You can, like, a uh, hundred grams of food, one eighth of a gram is going to be plenty for you to experience it in, in its full. And that, that to me is like a, a good, like a personification of some of the things that grow here. It's so brightly flavored a lot of the grasses, the weeds, the flowers, uh, the purslane that we get from here is so bright and thick and, and, and hardy. The okra from Texas is so beautiful and rich. And that's sort of the gift that the heat gives is it 
it gives all this resistance to these vegetables that grow that in order to be resistant, in order to be stronger, they have to develop these stronger, more powerful phenols that make it brighter, stronger, not always more pleasant and certainly not more subtle, but gives it this, all these, uh, these powers in that, in that other direction. You have specific citrus here as well in Texas. Okay. So citrus is not a thing that comes from Texas. Okay. And, and yet it is a thing that in the South we're famous for. And it gets me back into this floor and fauna. Thank you so much for of the South here, which is every single region has its own thing that helps in preser preservation. The earth was generous enough to give that to us, right? And then we were smart enough to take some of those things and realize that the environments were fairly similar, which is what happened with citrus. So all the citrus that is here, which now in some ways is invasive in a beautiful invasive way, is not wild. It's not indigenous. They may have been here for a long period of time, and there are wild limes, quite seedy, totally delicious. And they grow in the, uh, in the Austin area even, right? The best citrus goes a little bit south from here in Texas because, again, think about the regionality and where it grows. That's why Florida, all those sort of things, mm -hmm. grow really great quality citrus. But what is here natively are nopales and cactus, which have a very low pH, hackberry which is a uh, very small red fruit. It's quite hard. It's also incredibly delicious. Uh, monk's pepper, green briar, you know, the uh, chiltepines. There is a really interesting fir oaks and white oaks that grow that, you know, if you put into the river and leach out their tannins like the Native Americans used to do, you have this beautiful natural kind of nuttiness that you have from that. There was uh, a tremendous amount of indigenous potatoes here that were all ripped out because they were really hard to farm or the animals themselves would trip over the knotted weeds and therefore they were pulled out and we would put in the more traditional varietals of those potatoes. And so we're looking to kind of replant some of those. There's this really interesting fruit that, first of all, devil's claws, which are edible, are quite delicious. And then there's this interesting item called the toothache berry that we've just started to mess around with where the actual berry, when it's ripe, will numb your entire mouth. Just okay. like a Szechuan, right? Mm -hmm. It's very similar yeah, to Szechuan yeah. pepper, but, but to a hundred times more. Oh, wow. Okay. So if you let it dry, you can use maybe two toothache berries, which has gotten its name from quite the sensation, or its leaves to create a Szechuan effect to a broth or, or something like that. And mm -hmm. They grow native to this area. Okay. So do you guys go foraging, for instance? Do you we, use some we of these? We do, yes. Restaurant? And again, as I spoke of before, managing somebody that you have a knowledge of and recognizing that they are far more specialized. We have a forager, Will Nickel, mm -hmm. who has the ability and is way more specialized in this and, and better at it than me to go out into our environment and find these things. And we've tasked him and challenged him with not finding things that we already know, but finding things that don't have the natural culinary application that we've been doing with it. And monk's pepper is probably the most endemic item that we you know, now need to use that was non-existent before. And it's quite amazing and delicious and aromatic. You know, Hoya Santa is another thing that was maybe not naturally from here, but grows so, so well here. Poplo would fall under that same sort of classification of something that does really, really well here. Mesquite, an invasive species. They, they brought it over to Africa. They can't get rid of it. And yet the pods are edible when they're green. The green mesquite after, now we're calling it green mesquite, but the pods then once they've dried. So but they're the pod? First of all, you can eat the beans when they're, when they're really, really green. And secondly, if you toast them for a while, they enzymatically will break down and develop a tremendous amount more sugar, and you can use that as a flour or we make it into vinegars, or we make it into broths. Wow. It's really, really, really delicious. Moringa. I mean, there's jujube dates, the wild Mexican plums here. Um, and, and all those are not edible on their own. They have incredible yeast that, that grow on them. I mean, they're, they're really special stuff. Okay, guys, I'm looking at the time, and we have been talking, or you have been talking for, for a while. I have to be conscious of your... Your time as well on this Sunday. So I'm going to um, end up and wrap up with uh, my famous series of rapid fire questions. Pet peeves. So 
What drives you crazy in the kitchen? I have a lot of pet peeves, by the way. My nickname used to be Chef Picky uh, because, <laughs> because I'm, I'm so picky about a bunch of little things. But I would say the one that drives me, like if you're going to see me, uh, if you're going to see me lose it, it's during service. If, I, if I'm plating something and they pass me a deli container and it still has the lid on it. Nothing probably makes me more angry than like take the lid off before you hand it to me. That's probably my biggest pet peeve in the kitchen. I think my biggest pet peeve is, uh, I will say during service, is when somebody puts something up that they know isn't right. When they're just too busy and they know it and they put it to me with this expectation that I'm too busy as well to not call them out on their BS. And that will put me over the edge because I'll turn back around to them and I'll and I very easily say, this is your legacy. Like This is what you doing. This isn't me, right? Like I, I, I am where I am. Like if you don't care enough to where when you're busy, you're going to compromise and try and hope to get it out. That's a, a much more endemic of them than it is of me. I'm going to come up with another one since that was, that was mine as well. That's, oh. <laughs> that's my <laughs> biggest one. And it's in it, like alongside that is someone will put something up and then cook will put up the dish and then I like, turn an eye away like as if like this wounded puppy or like, please don't hit me <laughs> kind of look as if like, obviously we don't hit anyone in the kitchen, but there's this oh. like, there's, there's, <laughs> there, there's like this shame of, I just did something I'm not supposed to do. My, so since Kevin already used that one, I'm, I'm going to say a cook putting a towel, towel that they're working with down on a work surface that, that in, in the restaurant, we use vinegar towels and we wipe our, all of our surfaces keep everything clean and that that towel goes back in its very particular place we keep them in nine pans in vinegar they stay sort of sanitized and and clean in that way Mm -hmm. when a cook takes a towel either that towel or a towel out from their apron and wipes something and leaves it on the counter that is something that i don't know how they are able to sleep through the night knowing that they did that for a moment (laughs) okay so how do you chill out after service I meet up with Kevin and smoke cigars. <laughs> we all smoke cigars. <laughs> okay, now we have a new uh, guest with uh, Andre, I guess. After service, you know, I, I, I try to not live close to work. So I moved further because how I chill out after work is the only alone time I have. Is, you know, when I'm at work, I'm, at, I'm chef. And when I'm at home, I'm dad. So the car, the car ride home is the unwind. So whether I'm listening to a podcast or an audio book or music, so your podcast. Thank you. <laughs> it's, I try to make the drive extra long. That's how I unwind. It's just that alone time. I was serious when I said, hang out with Kevin, smoking cigars. That, that is a real thing. It is not in the everyday. In the everyday, the, the unwinding, I wish it was. But in the everyday, it is meditation. I try to meditate. I've been doing the same sort of practice for almost 20 years, 20 minutes, twice a day. And finding the time to do that makes the day so much so much better when when I feel like I'm just getting the time for myself and the act itself, the meditation, lovely. But I think that can be anything that you do for yourself. That could be even driving. I I, I feel like in a way, like I totally relate and having that little time of just being by yourself. Mm-hmm. I want for you to be able to do that and be able to pull over and listen to it, not have to be doing something active while you're doing it, you know? But don't worry, he's totally zoning out when he's driving. <laughs> <laughs> Do you listen to uh, music when you're in the kitchen? Oh, no. Music is on or music is off? I just sent an email to my whole staff saying, if you put music on again during prep or that you will be written up immediately. I played music for a living for a long time. Mm-hmm. I love music. Friends. It's a part yeah. of me. And I, I despise having music on in the kitchen. I despise it. I feel like it gets in the way of all the things. So it's kind of a joke for my staff and me that I'm so not musically inclined. I've started singing recently because I have a two-year-old. I appreciate it. I'm not motivated by it, which is very different than most chefs. But I like run to books on tape or, or, or podcasts or things like that. You know, like I, I, I crave learning more than anything. And I think that today there is such this need for stimulation and distraction and you're allowing yourself to be deeper with and more intimate with the task that you're doing yields more details, yields more evolution, yields more recognition of that. And that to me is why you don't allow music is that it forces this calmness 
with the tasks that you have at hand so you can evolve your details of that faster. I'm going to say there's no music in the kitchen also. So it's it's one of those things that uh, I've never allowed music in the kitchen. When I had a radio in the kitchen early on in my career, there was a fist fight that broke out by two of the girls in Garde Manger because people were changing the station. So ever since then, I said, okay, we can't all agree on the music. There's going to be no music in the kitchen. And you know, I've, I've never worked in a place in the last 15 years or so that we're, we've allowed music in the kitchen. However, I will say that uh, every now and again, I'll come in at a time that I'm not supposed to be here. And then the music's going like, wait, the chef, Andre's gone for the day. Or, and, then you, and then you wander into the kitchen. It's like, well, the standard should hold true even, even when I'm not here. So I'm, I'm not a fan of music in the kitchen. However, if I am listening to music in the kitchen, it would probably be if I was at home cooking and I was completely alone. It would probably be the only time I would listen to music in the kitchen. What tools besides your knives you can't work only without? I have a pair of tweezers that I want to officially endorse for everyone. They're called triangle tweezers or straight edge. Our entire team literally gets them imported directly from Denmark, but through Germany. And so we had like I had to write in Danish, you know, translate over to this company that ships over a box of, like fifty at a time. Because like you know, all these companies in the U.S. like JB and all this sort of stuff have their own set of tweezers, but these are like Rene Redzipi's tweezers. No, uh, they 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 are the same tweezers that everyone yeah. in Noma uses. First yeah. of all, but they're you know they're a German company. They just happen to be there, and they're so much better and more efficient at all the little things that you need to do. And it's like, once you use that, you're like, why would I ever use any of these other ones? And like, so everybody in our kitchen gets one basically when they uh -huh. start. And then if they're like misplaced, they have to use their other tweezers. And they're always like, where are my triangle tweezers? Who's using my triangles? I mean, it's really a huge difference. I have no reference for these triangle tweezers. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have bring triangle tweezers. Do you have any? No, I don't. I'll, I'll bring cigars. <laughs> Gosh, I, to me, like wooden spoons, like a lot of, I make cheese every day, like four times a day. We make fresh mozzarella a weekend shift. We're making it four times during service so that every time anyone gets it, it is freshly pulled, warm, still like you can still feel it sort of almost like pulsing. I want, I want when I eat it, that it's alive, that it's melting, that it's, that it's a rare fried experience in order to get that texture. The process of making mozzarella is just burning yourself. You're burning your hands in 200 degree water. Pull it out. Your only help in mitigating those constant burns is like some sort of wooden utensil, a wooden apparatus. Because if you steal the curds of the cheese, like falls off. Wooden utensils are useful in that, like they have like a print. They have like a texture, just like your, like your palms do. Like when I'm pulling mozzarella, I, I never put gloves on because You lose all the texture that you need to make to do all the finery of the of the manipulation of the product. So when, if you use like a wooden spoon, it's like an extension of your hand. You can still feel what's happening with it. I love wooden spoons for that reason. For me, it's it's probably a, a bench scraper or a uh, a pastry scraper. The little plastic ones fit neatly on your workstation. Just I don't like mess. So something that could easily run across the cutting board and put things neatly in another container or You avoid scraping your knife. You know, you see so many cooks just scrape their knife and, and, and ruin their edge on the cutting board. Yeah, just something that could, I'm extremely picky, as I alluded to earlier. So just having things neat and orderly help. And if there's a way to keep the cutting board cleaner and to have less food on the floor and more food in the pan, great. So I think for me, that's the tool that I would say every, every cook, when they come in, I say, where's, where's your, you know, here we call it the pass card. Where's your pass card? Oh, you don't have one here. I'll give you one. Use this. Don't make a mess. Work clean and work faster. There's two things in the kitchen that I always tell people. There's two things that you'll never hear me say, and that's you're working too clean or you're working too fast. Okay, last one. So what is the worst dish you have ever created? I'll go on this. So I was in a, uh, I was in a chili competition early on in my career, and I was that creative chef that we were making fun of earlier in the podcast. And I thought, well, how am I going to win this chili competition? I thought, oh, I got a great idea. I'll throw some blueberries in it. <laughs> so, so as a very young cook, I, I made a, a, a ven uh, no, it was a bison and blueberry chili. Um, and it was terrible, by the way. And I didn't understand why I lost the competition. I was like, wow, it's very creative. Why didn't, why did no one get the fact that you know, no one else put blueberries in their chili? How dare they not like my blueberry chili? 
that wasn't the worst part. The worst part is I was still so young in my career, I didn't understand that I scorched the pot. So the pot was scorched. So the whole the whole pot of chili tasted like, you know, like a scorched pot with blueberries in it. <laughs> and as people would come up to my station and try the food, they're like, this is a very interesting flavor. What is it? Oh, it's the, it's the, it's the blueberries, of course. <laughs> Um, until one of the, you know, there was a culinary school instructor, you know, as they, as they are at these events. And you know, I was a young kid. I don't, I don't know how old I was, but you know, I was for the sake of conversation, let's say I was 22 years old and someone came up to me and said, you know, you scorched that, right? And I said, what? No. And then I stirred the pot and I was like, oh yeah, I, I, I recognize that I scorched it. So not only was it terrible an idea, it was also terribly executed. So worst dish I've ever made. I'm going to go ahead and say, I think we did this dish of kohlrabi and daikon with like cucumber and it was gorgeous totally gorgeous but it just didn't taste like anything and like these are all very neutral mild things yeah, yeah. that can go horribly wrong and like i think that like when you're creating something like that the amount it ha- it happens a lot too so if i was doing a tasty menu and i was going to serve like one small bite or two of those things combined, I could see that that having impact earlier on in the meal. We're a, you know, a, a share plate restaurant. So if you get one or two bites of like a dis of kohlrabi and daikon that, that look gorgeous, it just doesn't, it was on the dim sum cart too. So it's like going next to like Johnny cakes and bread and stuff. And we're like, why is this thing not selling? <laughs> you know, and we served it like at the last course too. So it was like going around when you're eating your entrees and you're like, Oh, here's these discs of kohlrabi and daikon and i think it happens with everybody right and like you just get too close to something Mm -hmm. and when you get too close to something you become like enamored with what like your vision of it can be and you like forget all the other social parameters of what makes a dish great like kohlrabi you think man there these are beautiful ingredients that i love and i want them to love i'm going to show them how to love it sometimes they just don't want to and sometimes with those ingredients you have to step so far out of bounds in order to or so, so far inbounds in order to do it that you m- might lose something. I have a tie, two dishes. The fir- first, first dish I ever made, I was eight years old and I was like, I'm going to make a cake by myself. I'm going to make this beautiful cake. My best friend, Layla, was over and I was like, Layla, we're going to make a cake. She said, like, oh, do we have a recipe for the cake? And I was like, no, 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 I'm just going to make it. I'm just going to make the cake. Flour, some, a lot of cinnamon, <laughs> some, some other stuff. I'm really happy I didn't burn the house down. We did a good job in, in putting everything together, but what I made was almost unbreakable disc that I couldn't get the dog to eat. Like, like I passed it around to adults to try sure. my cake yeah, and they, they wouldn't eat it. And then I tossed it and it wouldn't, it wouldn't break and the dog wouldn't eat it, but the dog would chase it, retrieve it. So we had this, uh, very, very cinnamon, frisbee. very, very aromatic frisbee f- <laughs> for about a week until it broke down. Uh, and then uh, I was a pastry chef for a while at Roberta's, but I was making at Roberta's in Brooklyn. I was tasked with making the pastries from my home for the restaurant. And so I made this, I was making a Earl Grey cheesecake for like this Earl Grey mascarpone cheesecake, made all the parts, made everything. It was like, I had made a version of it the week before. It was gorgeous. I was so excited about it. I'm like, oh my God, they're going to be so stoked about it in the restaurant this week and I got the cheesecake done and I was sort of in a rush to get some things done, drove it over to the restaurant in traffic. <laughs> I get it there and I drop it off. It's a Friday. I get a message from Gabe who is like running the kitchen that day about a half an hour later. He's like, so is this supposed to be like one of those, uh, runny, like fall apart in the middle things? And I was like, Oh no, I've never been so embarrassed as a cook. Most of my embarrassment was because I, I was so proud of the flavor of this beautiful thing that I made that I didn't pay attention to the fact that I undercooked my cheesecake. And then I sort of like took down dessert service for the restaurant that weekend and I wasn't there to fix it. Wow. So I felt like a jerk. So that was like, that was a big miss. Sorry, Gabe. Okay, guys. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much for, um, you know, all the stories and, uh, and the discussion. Thank you, Fiori. Thank you, Kevin, for joining. Same to you, um, you know, Andre, and, and thank you for the, um, the meal. Thanks, you know, thank your team, you know, for putting this together. Thank you for bringing, uh, you know, a dessert as well, Fiori. I mean, they, we haven't talked about the dessert, but the, the tartatan, which is 
really delicious. And then this uh, tart uh, that you learn, I think, from Lyon, correct? With uh, flan and, and from almond in there? My, my host mother, Anne O'Hennison, that I lived with in, in Lyon, made this for me and gave me the recipe for it. Yeah, so it's this delicious. Is based on very that. Good. So again, thank you uh, very much and, um, you know, for being guest on the show. Again, for Fiori and, uh, and for Andre and hopefully Kevin, maybe we can do a, a recording on you and I, you know, very soon. Thank you again. Thank you, guys. I really did enjoy these two episodes with Chef Andre Natera, Chef Kevin Fink and Chef Fiori Tedesco from Austin. Let me know your thoughts. This is really important to me as I am working on future episodes. You can send your feedback via the comment section on the bottom of the episode page on flavorsunknown.com. If you like the show, please share it with a friend on Apple Podcasts or any other phone podcast app you use. In two weeks, I will have two guests on the show. They are together in life and together in the kitchen of Noosh in San Francisco. Chef Sayat and Chef Laura Ozilmaz. Let's discover how is it to partner as a married couple and share as well a kitchen. And the focus of this episode will be around Middle Eastern, Eastern Mediterranean food. I see you in two weeks. And until then, remember that people who love to eat are always the best people. Thanks for listening to Flavors Unknown. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave a review. Find the show notes at flavorsunknown.com. And if you want to join the Flavors Unknown community, search Flavors Unknown on Instagram and Twitter.